Hello everyone, welcome to Lben Tea House, I'm your host Lben. With the arrival of summer, many people like to enjoy the pleasure of skewering with a few close friends at the night market, and I'm no exception. Speaking of my favorite, it's definitely the Xinjiang Kebab. Have you ever noticed, no matter where in China, even in the smallest places, you can always find a Xinjiang Kebab stall, and the flavors differ between South and North Xinjiang. My personal summary is that the skewers from North Xinjiang are more aromatic, while those from South Xinjiang are known for their freshness. Apart from being a little more expensive, they have no other drawbacks. Tonight, our story is related to Xinjiang Kebab. This is a story I personally experienced during my school days. Back then, due to limited living expenses, the daily expenses were tight enough, let alone having a girlfriend, and life was particularly frugal. But even so, my foodie nature couldn't be suppressed. I remember once, a Xinjiang kebab stall came to the school entrance. The stall owner was Uyghur, who could sing and dance. Every time students got out of school, he would turn on music and perform, naturally making his lamb skewers very popular. His prices were sincerely cheap, regular Xinjiang kebab stalls charged 2 to 3 yuan per skewer, but his were only 50 cents. Beef kidney, which others sold for 4 yuan, was only 1 yuan and 50 cents at his stall. Other items like tendon, chicken wings, and lamb testicles were a lot cheaper there too, even more so than the neighboring Han Chinese barbecue stall. In no time, his business was booming, and everyone said his skewers tasted fresh and fragrant, fatty without being greasy. Many female students even said the more they ate his lamb skewers, the thinner they became, which is quite magical, isn't it? At that time, I would go there nearly every evening for a few drinks. Gradually, I became acquainted with the barbecue master, whose name was Alam Jong Tuligu. Uyghur names are too long, I only remembered Tuligu. During one of our chats over a drink, I asked him why his skewers were so cheap and whether they might not taste good. Other places sold them for so much more, could he still make a profit at his prices? He was reluctant to disclose, perhaps it was his trade secret, so I didn't inquire further. However, once on my birthday, I invited him for a drink, and I finally understood the mystery. That day happened to be my birthday, which falls on the 20th day of the 9th lunar month, equivalent to November 11th on the Gregorian calendar. I joked that there was no need for gifts, since in our student days, it seemed quite generous to treat others on our own birthday. Plus, having many friends, it only took a call to gather 20 or 30 people. Thinking about treating so many people to a meal, I was kneeling already. Then it occurred to me, Tuligu's place was not only cheap, but he was also very amiable. Although I wasn't sure exactly what religion he practiced and he certainly didn't sell alcohol, he wouldn't mind if you drank your own. Isn't that ideal? The skewers were cheap, and I could bring my own alcohol. Drink happily, and even if I spent 300 yuan, it would be enough. So, it was settled. After school, I gathered everyone and casually mentioned to the nearby shop to send over some drinks. And we sat down on benches by the roadside to drink. I've always enjoyed drinking heartily, never worrying about who might get drunk, as long as I was responsible for pouring. Anyone who drank slowly would be teased by me to speed up. That night, we drank from 6.30 until 9 o'clock, consuming countless boxes of alcohol and skewers that I couldn't even keep track of. However, I noticed his cool box for the skewers seemed truly magical. Since opening, he'd been using a foam box, like the ones used for ice cream in the past. The box wasn't large, so how could it hold so many skewers? Logically, having ordered so much, the boxes should have been empty. But as I continued to order more, Tuligu kept pulling skewers from the box. I became puzzled for a moment, was his lamb skewers cheap because there was some trick to the box? I got up to investigate, and suddenly, I noticed a group of students at the next table who seemed to have come at the same time as us, and they were a bit drunk, complaining incessantly about the poor quality of the barbecue stand for not having pork skewers. I thought these people were crazy, how could a Muslim possibly sell pork skewers? I only glanced at them, but that brief look was enough to provoke them. Like a classic northeastern winter opening line, they said to me, what are you looking at? Before I could respond, my classmates were already making a fuss, what's it to you if he looks? What followed was chaos, bottles and benches flew, and a fight broke out. Tuligu couldn't stand by and came to our side to help. Eventually, the matter escalated, and both the school security department and the police station were involved. We were dealt with and warned, but the worst part was that it also involved people from off campus. Disputes among students were manageable, but once outsiders got involved, things became complicated. 
The final resolution was that he couldn't set up his stall outside of campus anymore. This left me a bit heartbroken. What was I heartbroken about? What would I do now that he was gone? What would I eat? More importantly, during the fight, I had developed a deep friendship with the brothers from Afghanistan, and now they had been chased away just like that. Although Tulagu was leaving, he didn't seem too upset, after all, his lamb skewers were spot on in both price and taste, wherever he went. In the end, we agreed to meet at a halal restaurant to say a proper goodbye. During after dinner chats, someone joked that without three rounds of drinks, I would become talkative, but he did not like that saying. So we just had a few simple rounds. At that moment, I remembered his magical cool box, so I asked him, Tulagu, since you're leaving, tell me the truth, why are your lamb skewers so cheap? After a moment's thought, he finally decided to share a story about his father with me. Well Ben, do you know how we Uyghurs get our names? Unlike the Han Chinese, we Uyghurs have our given names before our surnames. My name is Alam Jong, and my father is Tulagu, so my full name is Alam Jong Tulagu. Hearing this, I found it quite interesting and asked, what kind of person was your father Tulagu? He told me that in 1980, his father was just an ordinary Xinjiang herdsman who, other than herding camels, had no special skills. At that time, there was no wild camel nature reserve in the Aksa Chin area, and the herders relied on their skills to attract wild male camels with domestic female camels. However, on June 17, 1980, an accident happened. That day, Tulagu was driving his camels, searching for the herd in the complex terrain of the Aksa Yi Chin. It was all too easy to stray into the uninhabited regions of the Lop Nua. Especially since there were no GPS navigations or satellite phones, for ordinary people who accidentally entered Lop Nua, the situation was often very dangerous, and even scientific research teams dared not tread into Lop Nua lightly. During this search, things did not go smoothly, and before he knew it, Tulidu had ventured several kilometers deep into the no man's land of Lop Nua. Trying to find his way out quickly, the sun blazed above him, foretelling the arrival of a severe sandstorm. This left Tulagu in despair, knowing that once the sandstorm passed, it would be nearly impossible to find a way out, much like attempting to reach the heavens. It was as if, after a June typhoon in Luntai, the waters on the earth surged like islands. And the dim night accompanied by flying sand cast red shadows towards the sun, scattering in the wind without any sense of direction. What to do in such a situation? Just as he was filled with anxiety, he saw what appeared to be a person on a distant dune. Tulagu urged his camels and rushed over. When he got closer, he saw a middle-aged man in a white shirt and blue trousers lying on the ground. Upon checking the man's breath, he found no signs of life. Searching his body, he found several items, a compass that could help Tulagu find his way out, a jade pendant that might be worth some money, and a diary. However, Tulagu could not recognize a single word in the diary and eventually discarded it. With the help of the compass, Tulagu, aided by the heavens, finally found his way out of Lop Nua. Later, he discovered that the jade pendant had a miraculous effect, it could replicate anything. Therefore, every day, Tulagu would place the jade pendant into the cooler, which is why there was always an endless supply of lamb skewers in his box. With this jade pendant, old Tulagu and his son left Xinjiang, and through the business of selling high-quality and low-price lamb skewers, they earned a substantial income without any capital. Just as I was contemplating all this, Tulagu took the jade pendant out of his pocket. I carefully examined it. It was a delicately carved Hishan mutton fat jade with a yin and yang fish design, exuding a disposition of benevolence, courage, nobility, and martial virtues. It seemed to be surrounded by a mysterious white light, an awe-inspiring sight that made me feel a sense of reverence and caution about handling it too much. Carefully, I returned the jade pendant to Tulagu. We reluctantly bade each other farewell and I asked him where he planned to go next. He replied that as long as his lamb skewers were cheap enough, there would be a market anywhere. I couldn't help but ask him, since he could replicate things, why didn't he just replicate money? Tulagu smiled and said that making counterfeit money was illegal. After saying this, he waved goodbye and rode off into the night on his three-wheeled bike. Many years later, as a student turned host of Tales of the Unusual, I was organizing materials and stumbled upon a story. In 1980, Peng Jiamu, the vice president of the Xinjiang Science Academy, was setting up scientific research in Lop Nua to save state expenses. Instead of transporting water sources, he left a note saying he was heading east to find a well, but mysteriously disappeared. 
various speculations about Peng Jiamu's disappearance then flooded society, some said he took survival supplies and fled, some thought he perished from diabetes, others guessed he was abducted by aliens. Even American media claimed to have seen this traitor Peng Jiamu at a restaurant. The rumors grew more mysterious, and the final account was that the country had discovered a double fish jade pendant with replicating abilities in Lop Nua. Leading to the emergence of numerous mysterious clones carrying viruses like those in zombie movies, creating an incredibly complex problem. Consequently, the country made Lop Nua into a nuclear test site, and after a big explosion, all problems disappeared along with the smoke. But who could have imagined that this pendant was actually used by a Xinjiang man to replicate lamb skewers as he did business far and wide. Friends, that's the story for today. I hope you all enjoyed it.